Okay, speaking of the idea of small, the idea of small, let me show you a verse. Let me show you a verse. I want to jump right into the conversation. I got a lot of information to share with you today. In the back of the Hebrew Scripture, the Old Testament, there's this great statement in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 4.10, 4.10. It's on the screen right now. It says, for who has despised the day of small things, the day of small things. When I say three at every campus, shout the word small. Ready? One, two, three. Everybody shout. Everybody shout. What? My goodness, my goodness. Uh, hello, Bezel T3. An American flag where the body of Christ gathers? I mean, so much for the Church of Jesus Christ being an embassy of the kingdom of heaven. You know, Christ's kingdom has no national flag or territory with borders, but instead it is a spiritual kingdom, including people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. And that is something that David Hughes, pastor of Church by the Glades in Coral Springs, Florida, has yet to understand. Now, it's September 11th, and Pastor David Hughes is preaching a sermon entitled, The Power of Small. The best sermon ever. (laughs) No lie. He actually says that. Here he is talking about the text he will misuse. It's Proverbs 30, verses 24 through 28. (laughs) Today's going to be good. It's going to be good. This text is rich. This passage is layered. It is so textured. It's so re- this is, and I've been working hard, praying extra hard, spending. This is going to be good. It's going to be good. In fact, I'm going to say it. Today is going to be. Today is going to be the best. Today is going to be the best sermon ever. Today is going to be the best sermon ever. Online, invite someone else, share this. I'm just saying it's going to be the best. Put your hands together for the best sermon ever. Wow. Pretty cocky fellow, this David Hughes. Now, to be fair, he does make one slight qualification. The best sermon ever on bugs, on bugs. The best sermon on bugs. Wait, I think I'm cocky or something. The best sermon on bugs. Uh, The best sermon on bugs. Well, okay then. It's a four-week series, this being the first, but David always uses a next big thing, hook, to keep the people coming back. So he teases the folks with next week's hijinks. We're going to talk about small. Put your hands together for small. I want to show you. Be here all four weeks. And if I can't convince you, uh, the creativity next week at this campus is going to blow your mind. So here's a taste of what Church by the Glades provided to assault the senses of the itching-eared throngs who keep showing up. I wish that I could fly into the sky so very high. little Lenny Kravitz with your proverbs, just like milk with your frosted flakes. Notice the honey I shrunk the kids motif in the background to accentuate the small things emphasis. So what does David have to say about Proverbs 30 verses 24 through 28? Believe me, it's going to bug you. And by the way, if you don't dig bugs, listen, give bugs a chance. Bugs can be cool. You think bugs are gross? So bugs can be beautiful. There's some beautiful bugs out there. There's magnificent moths and beautiful butterflies and uh, uh, bees. Bees are vital to any healthy ecosystem. Ants do intriguing things. So if you get creeped out by bugs, I'm not going to put any weird bugs, any scary bugs on the screen all four weeks. Right? Was that buzzing in the background? (laughs) I'm not sure. All right. Never mind that verse 26 of uh, Proverbs 30 is describing a species of rabbit that lives in the rocks. Now, David will focus on the fourth small thing, the locusts, because they advance. 
And according to David, so should you. And if you are so freaked out by bugs, these bugs are too much. When I say bugs, don't imagine these bugs. Imagine these bugs right here. Think about these bugs, because these bugs aren't scary at all. You think about cartoon bugs, Pixar, Disney bugs. All right, think about friendly, happy bugs. But the Bible commands us, look at these bugs. All right, let's get to that uh, thing about the locust advancing, and so should you. You know, God wants you to advance. If you're losing ground, slipping up, messing up, just stagnant, God wants to grow you. God wants to advance you. God desires progress in your life. He wants you to get better, smarter, stronger. He wants, he, mm. and if you're a Christian person, he wants to touch your life with divine momentum. Oh, advancement. Wow. You should be hungry for advancement. I want to maximize every God-given opportunity. I want to seize the fullness of my God-provided potential. Every young person, here's where you go to school and you work hard. Okay, that is such a great motivational speech right there. Perhaps David should have said that this best motivational speech ever will be on bugs. <laughs> the problem is this is supposed to be a Christian sermon. But David is bent on preaching bugs today. But he does wish that he had time to preach on yet another topic. Give me a grasshopper and give me a locust. A grasshopper and a locust. locust on the, there's no difference physiologically. It's their psychology. A grasshopper stays on his own his whole life and things eat him and victimize him. But locusts have this behavior that they are gregarious, gregarious. and nomadic. <laughs> they have this desire, certain environmental preconditions exist. Certain things happen in the environment. Uh -huh. I wish I had time to preach about environment today because, oh my gosh, environments you, you choose are huge. Environments can build you or break you. Uh, yeah, because it's so important to go to church to be... Uh, to be uh, listening to a sermon on environments, and he wishes he had the time to preach on environments because he's always he's already preaching on bugs. <sighs> okay, this is just as good a place as any to say that the devil definitely thinks that this is the best sermon ever because there is absolutely no gospel in it. However, David does go to the New Testament. He goes to Hebrews to tie in the locust motif of being stronger together. <clears throat> Let me bounce right now. Let me take you uh, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, let's go to the New Testament. I want you to see this. This is about Christians and people of, of faith. And what should we be doing to maximize people our of faith. faith and maximize <laughs> our potential? It says we should be doing this certain thing. It's very, very important. It says, let us not give up meeting together. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Okay, so the author of Hebrews is writing to Christian people like, hey, some of y'all skipping church. <laughs> okay, that seems a little out of left field, does it not? But there's always a reason that a preacher will bounce around using unrelated verses. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people here today, but I'll just tell you this, because I run the numbers. There were more people at our church in 2019 than today. Why did they unplug? COVID. Uh, David, you know, the senior pastor of the church, uh, he runs the numbers. He, he sounds more like a CFO of a corporation than a minister of word and sacrament. But the Bible commands us, commands us, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together. Do not stop meeting together. Because if you want to maximize your advancements, we do it together. 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 <laughs> okay, the reason we meet together as the body of Christ is not so that we can maximize our advancements. No, the passage in Hebrews tells us to hold resolutely to the hope we profess and that we are to consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds and to encourage one another. And how do we do that? By not neglecting to meet together. And we are to do this and all the more as we see the day of the Lord's return approaching. But like mission creep in a war, this so-called sermon will creep from bugs to who you hang out with. So here's my question. Who's in your entourage? Who's in your entourage? Who are your closest friends? Well, how do I even know? Who are the favorites on your phone? Who are the favorites on your phone? 
It's been said, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. These people in the audience, or at least some of them, they, they seem to hang on David's every word. They are enamored with him. Really, this is how they welcomed him after he came back from his summer vacation. Oh, what is up, CBG? Standing ovation. Oh, stop. Thank you, thank you. So humble. It, it, okay, y'all sit down. Thank you. It's very kind. If you're if you're a guest, that's not what they normally do. Just just you know, I've, I've been I've been out for about a month and a half, and it's the longest break I've taken in 20 plus years. So thank you for the break. And- <laughs> when the pastor becomes the focus, God the Holy Spirit, well, he just sits back and watches, and worse yet, he is grieved because his task when the people of God gather together is to shine a very bright light on Jesus, the Son, through the preaching of the Word. The pastor is simply the errand boy to deliver the message that has the power to save sinners from hell. Proverbs 13 says this. Proverbs 13 talks about even drills in more deeply. Verse 20 says, walk with the wise, you become wise. Conversely, for the companion of fools suffers harm. Ever notice if you hang out with stupid people long enough that stupid's contagious? I got to tell you, this is a very good example of what's been called moralistic therapeutic preaching. You give the people some morality, you know, some shoulds and oughts, along with some funny stories or a topic like bugs. You find verses that help you with your illustrations and kind of tie them together like various charms on a bracelet. It's therapeutic in that it speaks to our old Adam, who always wants to work his way into heaven on his own strength. We hear the law, and then we say to ourselves, well, I'll turn over a new leaf. You know, we we do this in our minds as we listen, and it makes us feel better. The pastor then tacks on a little God or Jesus at the very end and thinks that he has preached a Christian sermon. But this could not be further from the truth. David will now give the people a recipe for finding wise people, not bugs, but wise people to hang out with. You're not going to find the wise person you're looking for, you know, passed out at the frat house Sunday morning. You're not going to find Christian single person, God's person for your life, swiping white right on some hookup app. Too real? Sorry, too real, too close to home for somebody. You will find them as you immerse yourself in the house of God. Okay, the house of God. Now, David, do you mean where the people come together for the corporate worship of God through a dialectical rhythm of God's people speaking to him through prayers and confession and praise and God speaking to his people through his word and sacrament? Is that what you mean? Not just worship. This is great. Worship's powerful. We pray better and we sing better and we probably study the Word of God better together. But I'm telling you, when you take the next step and you find a life group or you volunteer habitually or you go to Financial Peace University or Celebrate Recovery or all these different groups we have, when you take that step, well, what steps should I take? If you don't know, after the service, go out those doors to the little lounge called Best Next Steps. We'll help you figure out your best next step. Uh-huh. Well... Not just worship. I mean, that's fine. We do our best at Church by the Glades to entertain you each and every Sunday. But the real action is found in life groups or Financial Peace University or habitually serving Church by the Glades. (laughs) David is convinced that words alone does not a good sermon make. So David will use props to help us understand the kinds of relationships we ought to have. And I love illustrations. If you're new to our church, sometimes illustrations of something physical helps a spiritual idea become clear, a parable. So I'm going to use beverages because the Bible says certain relationships uh, refresh us. Okay, okay. He will actually use beverages uh, and actually non-beverages in order to make his point as to how um, this has uh, actually uh, zero to do with the the Proverbs 30 or bugs 
or real uh, bugs or even cartoon bugs? One of four kinds of people. Think about uh, beverages or a liquid. I got these examples here. Some people, sadly, that might be in your life right now, um, the liquid represent them? Poison. Poison people. Not a beverage. Got some people. Can you see? Oh, that's, 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 it's empty, but poison, poison, all right. All right, that is definitely not a beverage, but needed in his illustration. Most people you meet, I think, are just kind of like more like water. It's more like water. You, you know, you need people in your life. You need hydration in your life. And, and most people in the course of your busy day, you will meet and have a brief encounter. Not really positive or neutral. It's something kind of quick. It's the dry cleaner. It's the person of Publix, right? It's whoever you meet, those quick things. So how do you handle these relationships? Be nice. Christian, please be nice. <laughs> That is the moralism component in moralistic therapeutic preaching. It's basically third grade golden rule stuff that's in no way exclusive to Christianity at all. And then there's some people in your life, some people in your life, these people, they're a little closer than this. Some people, they're not poisonous people, but these people in your life, when they, they show up, you're like, oh, there she is. They say, oh, he's texting me for the seventh time. Oh, 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 you know, the exhausting people, right? Those, you know, God loves them. Those more grace required people. What, what's the beverage for them? These draining people. <laughs> they are the prune juice people of life. The prune juice, right? They just drain you. They, they exhaust you. They're all, oh, got right? Prune juice people in your life. Now, I just went too far for someone. I went too far. I said, David, that is not appropriate. That is not appropriate. And I would take you again back to the Word of God, to Philemon chapter 1, verse 20, in the authorized King James Version of the Bible, which says, Yea, brother, let me have the joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my... Some people refresh the bowels, some drain the brows. Oh, boy, boy, boy. You see how it's just kind of a, I don't know, a Bible passage salad that he puts together to talk about what he wants to talk about. I mean, David says he'll take us to the Word of God in order to use prune juice as part of his illustration. And for one thing, in, in Philemon, it's, it's, mostly, it's most often translated uh, as Paul encourages Philemon to accept his runaway, his runaway slave Onesimus, and in so doing, he would refresh Paul's heart in Christ. Not exactly bowels, but you could use that, but in order to use prune juice in a illustration, oh, come on, man, be, get real, get real. All right, here comes the last beverage, and with it, uh, yet another plug for getting involved uh, to where the real action is. Finally, finally, there's a rare group of people, special people, and these people are the double espresso people of your life. The caffeinated people, man. They help you advance together. So I have coffee to represent coffee. Oh, guys, we forgot the coffee, oh, darn. guys. We, can someone fly me some coffee? Oh, perfect. Okay, so this is David's good buddy, Mario. And Mario is a group leader of a men's group called Band of Brothers. And that's why you are, to this day, one of the main double espresso people in my life. And uh, he leads a small group here. What's your small group here? Uh, Band of Brothers. I highly encourage it. We need each men's other. Group. <laughs> we need each other. When do they so, meet? Thursday night, right here at the lobby, and Friday morning at the lobby, 7 a.m., Friday morning, 7 p.m., Thursday night. Anyways, give it for Mario Padrino. Thank you. Brings Thank you. me Yay. coffee. Yay. You know, the sermon should be a time where God speaks to his people through his revealed word by the sometimes clunky and ordinary means of a preacher who is standing behind God's word and preaching from it, expounding what it says, not what he wants to say. You know, it's not a time to embed announcements, even for the really good stuff like small groups and band of brothers. Okay, <clears throat> to be able to keep with uh, Church by the Glades mixology is what they say, of, of the things that are important to, to, uh, important to them, where we read on their website, of the many things we value, the two we esteem most, and this is really good to hear, are Jesus and his word. But it wouldn't look like that from the way David preaches. Now, as I said before, with a 
therapeutic, a moralistic therapeutic preach, uh, a preacher preaching a moralistic therapeutic sermon, David will now tack on a little Jesus right at the very end. I'm small. I'm small. I mean, my, my resources are small. Uh, my experience is small. My support system is small. My abilities are small. My education, small. My aptitudes are small. Hmm. Have you not been paying attention? Who despises the day of small things? Who will despise the day of small things? Piano Who music will building. despise? Don't dismiss. Don't devalue small things. Small Here comes the guitar. Changes in your Bass and drums. Small changes in your behaviors. Small changes in your strategy can bear huge dividends. So you feel small, but Christian, you're not alone. Even if you give your heart to Christ today at the end of the service, you're not alone. I guess that was the invitation. Relationship. If you say yes to Christ today, you're not alone. It's you and the Father, and it's you and the Son, and it's you and the Holy Spirit. You are far from alone. And now let's get some people around you, some people who will believe in God and believe in you, who will love God and love you. You need some mighty men in your life like King David. If that happens, guess what? You will conquer kingdoms. You will bring down strongholds. If you do that, you'll finally take some turf. We'll bring about the expansion of your influence, the ter territory of your triumph. Because guess what? In Jesus' name, we don't do this in isolation. We advance together. Like we the locusts. advance together in community and unity. We advance together, not for our glory, but for God's glory. We advance together in Jesus' name. Father, help us recognize everyone needs the right people in our lives. Ooh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And there you go. There you go. Jesus does get honorable mention, does he not? But in this mashup of small things, bugs, relationships, and prune juice, the gospel that saves people from their sins and the coming wrath of God because of it was totally ignored. You know, take out the last minute of this message, and you could have heard this at a Jewish synagogue, a Rotary Club, a TED Talk, and of course, a Christian science gathering and a uh, church called Lakewood in Houston, Texas.